Hello and welcome. If you've just found this video, it's the ninth in the series which follows my progress as I take part in the 2023 Round Britain Rally. In this video, I go north. I do the last two landmarks in Englandshire and start my assault on Scotland. If you haven't seen any of the earlier videos, they're all gathered together on a playlist on my YouTube channel. Anyhow, without further ado, Let's get to the intro and then to the 10 landmarks that I have for you this time. Our first landmark of this trip is Cumbria 2 which, if you've seen the last video, you may remember was missing when I did most of the Cumbrian landmarks. This is the museum at Scaleby Hill, the Scaleby Hill Motorcycle Museum. The museum is owned and run by Mike Barry, a former racer and 100% petrol head. He's a wonderful collection of machines, from the exotic race bikes to the grey porridge commuters, from bikes of a great age to really quite modern stuff. There's even a few four-wheeled exhibits and some lovely memorabilia. If you are in the area, check whether it's open, as Mike still has a day job, and go and see it. It's great. Now then, how do? Welcome back again. This time we've come way up north. Well, way up north in England. There's an awful lot of Scotland to go yet but you'll see that soon. So what have we come to today? Today is this little motorcycle museum. And I might take a bit of video inside, but I'm not going to be doing all the chatting inside because I'm shy. So this is uh, Mike Barry's Classic Motorcycle Museum. And it's at Scaleby Hill, which is just outside Carlisle in Cumbria and it's a truly excellent thing. So uh, give us a minute and we'll take you inside and show you around. See you soon. Before we leave Mike's Marvellous Museum, I thought I'd give you a quick look in Tide with a, with a little video and a few stills. As you look round, there is just a wonderful collection of bikes. Um, you can see things such as a Francis Barnett, Gilera, Triumph, BSA, Coventry Eagle, MV Augusta, Ducati, you name it, there are so many different brands here and the bikes are just in lovely, lovely condition. Not only that, Mike does actually most of the restoration work himself, so he's more than happy to tell you about what he's done, how he's done it. He's just an all-round good chap. Do go and see the museum. It's brilliant. The next landmark, the second of this trip, is one of the two in Dumfries and Galloway. The Orcarton Tower was built in the middle of the 15th century. It was built by John Cairns, who was gifted the lands, possibly as a reward for his support of James II in his successful struggle over the power of the Black Earls of Douglas. Interestingly, the tower is circular. Circular towers were common in the 13th century, but by 1400, they'd largely been replaced by towers and houses of square design. It's noteworthy that round towers are more common in Ireland, Although a link has been suggested, no hard evidence has been found to back this up. Now then, how do? We're back again. Now we're in Bonnie, Scotland. And we've come to see that. The Old Carton Tower. Which, uh, if I remember the little bit I read about it, it was a bit unusual because by the time they made it, the guy designed it round when everybody was building square towers, which must say something. Mostly it's still up there, unfortunately. 
we do have a danger of falling masonry sign. So, as usual, I shall give you a bit of a talk when we get back and a bit of a voiceover. And there you'll notice we have a spare body. That's Helen, that's the other half. So she's come to join me. But a beautiful location in Dumfries and Galloway. Right, I shall see you all later. Bye for now. We are on our way to Colston in Ayrshire and the next landmark which is Bar Castle. From what I found out this probably dates from the 15th century and was known as Lockhart's Tower. This is because it was originally built for the Lockhart family who held the barony of Colston. It's said that William Wallace took refuge in this castle to escape pursuing English soldiers and eventually escaped a siege by climbing down an overhanging tree. Now then, how do? We're back again, we're in Ayrshire and we've come to see that. What's that you ask? Well, it's big and it's Bar Castle in Golston. And we've just had a lovely lecture and a little old fellow walking his dog talking about sandstone and how sandstone has layers and you've got to get it to lay the right way where it flakes off in lumps and your building looks scabby. So there you go. I'll just walk to the other end, see if you can get a better view of it. As usual, there'll be more in uh, a voiceover later when I've worked out what it's all about. But there you go. The sandstone tower. Bar Castle. Isn't that lovely? Right, I've got one more to do today, so we'll be off. See you soon. This is the fourth landmark in this video and the last of this day. We're on our way to the second landmark of Dumfries and Galloway, the Devil's Beef Tub, near Moffat. It's also been known as the Marquis Annandale's Beef Tub, Beef Stand, or McLaren's Loop. It's a 500 foot or 150 meter deep hollow formed between four hills. Great Hill, Pete No, Annandhead Hill and Ericstain Hill. And it's also where one of the two main sources of the River Annan rises. Why the Devil's Beef Tub? The name is because it was used by the border reavers of the Johnston clan, who, who were known by their enemies as devils, to hide cattle they had just taken from south of the border. The reference to the Marquis of Annandale is because Lord Annandale was chief of the raiding loons, which in this case loons means lads and not lunatics. Either way, it's an absolutely beautiful place and the uh, A road, the A701, is absolutely awesome. Very much recommended. It's a lovely drive. Now then, how do? Back for the last time today. And this time we've come to see the Devil's Beef Tub, which is that good big hole down there. Lots of legends about the Devil's, Devil's Beef Tub, mostly involving where the Devil kept its cattle. But we'll do a voiceover and give you some of the uh, proper information about that. Other than that, it's Scotland at its most dramatic. What a lovely, lovely place to look at. Right, that's it for now. We'll catch you again tomorrow. Bye for now. Welcome to a new day and to our fifth landmark on this trip. 
This is the border's contribution to the uh, landmarks, Sessford Castle. The castle is large and, in its day, was a formidable fortress. It was built by Andrew Kerr, an ancestor of Robert Kerr, first Earl of Roxburgh, in 1450. The main building is an L-shaped structure of up to six storeys and with walls 13 feet or 4 metres thick. The English regarded it as the third strongest castle in Scotland. In 1523 the Earl of Surrey was tasked with taking the castle. He attacked whilst the castle's owner was absent and made little progress with his attack until Sir Andrew Kerr arrived and surrendered the castle in exchange for being allowed to depart with bags and baggage. The Earl of Surrey remarked that if the defence had continued, he doubts that the castle could have been taken. Certainly it looks like a big chunky sort of building. Now then, how do, and welcome back to a slightly soggy Scottish Borders. Although, it does give you some really dramatic skies. So what we've come to see today, we've come to see Sessford Castle. All the remains thereof, which is over there. What a beautiful place for a castle to be. Sure it wasn't quite so entertaining when people were lobbing rocks at you, but there you go. Sessford Castle, near Kelso, in the Scottish Borders. How wonderful. Next is the last RBR point in Englandshire, so we shall go and see that. Bye for now. We have hopped over the border to Englandshire and Northumberland's landmark. Geffrin. This is the site of a royal township. In the 7th century the kings of Northumberland had a palace on a site very near to here. If you do a search on the internet there's quite a bit of detail about the various archaeological digs on the site and how they have used modern technology to discover more. In AD 731 the scholar Bede records that King Edwin and his queen were residing here when the Queen's Bishop, Paulinus, that would be Bishop Paulinus of York, baptised many in the nearby River Glen. Another report says that Paulinus spent 36 days baptising new converts in that river at that time. Must have been a busy boy. Now then, how do and welcome back. So what have we come to see? Because this is the last of the RBR points in Englandshire. And this is it. A monument to Geffrin, the royal township. Uh, the uh, place of the Anglo-Saxon kings of Northumbria. And I have to say, it is one heel of a pretty place. Let me just walk you back this way. Yeah, taking the edge. Remarkably bracing. This is the uh, the place we find ourselves in. Which is one of the joys of the Round Britain Rally. Where you do get to see some stunning places. Right, now it's time for a brew. So we'll catch you later. Bye for now. Back into Scotland to East Lothian and Hales Castle. This is seventh of the ten landmarks in this video and the last on this particular day. Hales Castle is a mainly 14th century castle. A fortified house was built by Hugh de Gourlay before 1300 on this site, making it one of the oldest of its kind in Scotland. The de Gourlays were a Northumbrian family and as such supported England in the Wars of Independence. That meant the lands were forfeited to the Scottish Crown. 
The council was greatly extended by Sir Patrick Hepburn, First Lord of Hales, in the mid-1400s. From the little I've read, it seems to have had an eventful time in the 15th century, but ended up being used as a granary in the mid-19th century. How are the mighty fallen? Welcome back! So, this is the last one for today, and this is Hales Castle. Which you can see, hiding behind the trees, or well, maybe you can't. We're uh, right in the bowels of Lothian. Just had a look over the Firth of Forth. And uh, it is uh, windy and occasionally dripping from that up there. But other than that, it's been an absolutely wonderful day. I'm just walking you along this way to see if we can get a better view of the castle. Because it's uh, quite a thing. And there we are. Hales Castle. As usual, I'll tell you a bit more about it when we know a bit more. As we start a new day, we're heading for the eighth landmark on this video. This is Lanarkshire's contribution, Stanrig Pit Memorial. This commemorates the fatal collapse of a mine on the 9th of July 1918. The mine, which was on moorland near Plains, suffered when an area of about an acre dropped. This was due to heavy rains, heavy rains in the area and the moss getting waterlogged. At the time, about 70 men were underground. 19 of these were entombed and of those, 11 were never found. The dead included eight teenagers, two sets of fathers and sons, three brothers, and three brothers-in-law. Such a tragedy. Now then, how do? Back again. And now, we've come to the Stanrig Pit Disaster Memorial which is in, uh, in this place. This is a surprisingly quiet place, just outside Airdrie. And that is the disaster stone. So the Stanrig Pit disaster was in 1918 and uh, 19 men and boys were killed and 11 bodies were never recovered. An amazingly quiet place. There you go. Right, onward further. Speak to you soon. Bye for now. We are on our way to Stirling's landmark, the plaque at Arklet Dam. Loch Arklet is a freshwater loch in the Trossachs area between Loch Lomond and Loch Katrine. It was created as a reservoir for Glasgow and now measures two and a half miles or four kilometres long by half a mile or 0.8 of a kilometre wide. Any overflow from the dam drains down into Loch Lomond. The dam itself was constructed between 1910 and 1915 but the loch was used to supply water as far back as 1855. I've included a little footage of what happens when you ignore the passing places on a single track road. The man whose car was in the ditch was quite phlegmatic about it. Apparently this isn't an unusual occurrence. Not sure I'd have been quite so calm. Now then, how do? We're back again. We finally found a bit of sunshine, which is really lovely. So, we're at the far end of the Arklet Reservoir. And what have we come to see? But the Arklet Dam plaque. We 
which tells you who did what when it was built which is very nice but nicer is the uh, the water itself there you go we are in a quite a remote bit of Scotland but isn't that fantastic right I've got a long way to go so I shall disappear off and catch you later bye for now this is the last landmark of this day and of this video although the trip does continue into the next video we're going to Argyll and Butte to see the egg shed at Ardrish Egg I did try and find out more about this than I said to camera but I couldn't find much more I did keep finding sites that told me it was at the start of Britain's most beautiful shortcut that turns out to be a reference to the Crinan Canal which runs between Ardrish Egg and Crinan which saved the long diversion around the Kintyre Peninsula. Now then, how do? Welcome back. So, we've now made it to Ardrish Egg and uh, we've come to see that little beauty. It's called the Eggs Shed and its last use was of sorting bird's eggs. But in times past, it was part of the buildings where you would you, you would extract tannin from bark for uh, for fishermen's uh, nets. So there we go. We've also got a boat just in. So we've got loads and loads and loads of people. So I'm going to disappear off and take myself up to uh, Oban, where it's just stop for the night. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Bye for now. As we fall off Hum and Be Wold for one more time, it just remains for me to say thank you for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the like button and consider subscribing and then hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified of any future videos I make. If you've been keeping tabs you'll know that I'm running out of landmarks. In the next video I should finish collecting all the landmarks. Hopefully I'll see you then. Bye for now.